uh, as I always commence with a little recitation of the Quran for purposes of barakah, inshallah. <clears throat> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والليل إذا يغشى والنهار إذا تجلى وما خلق الذكر والأنثى إن سعيكم لشتى فَأَمَّا مَنْ أَعْطَى وَاتَّقَى وَصَدَّقَ بِالْحُسْنَى فَسَنُيَسِّرُهُ لِلْيُسْرَى وَأَمَّا مَنْ بَخِلَ وَاسْتَغْنَى وَكَذَّبَ بِالْحُسْنَى فَسَنُيَسِّرُهُ لِلْعُسْرَى وَمَا يُغْنِي عَنْهُ مَالُهُ إِذَا تَرَدَّى إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا لَلْهُدَى وَإِنَّ لَنَا لَلْآخِرَةَ وَالْأُولَى فَأَنذَرْتُكُمْ نَارًا تَلَظَّى لا يصلها إلا الأشقى الذي كذب وتولى وسيجنبها الأتقى الذي يؤتي ما له يتزكى وما لأحد عنده من نعمة تجزى إلا ابتغاء وجه ربه الأعلى ولسوف يرضى صدق الله العظيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه وبعد All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and all his family members, his wives, as well as his offspring. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all his companions. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all those who have struggled and strived to bring the deen to us in such a way that we are seated here this evening. Amen. And may Allah keep us steadfast and make us from those who can also carry the message of the deen to our children and to those around us in such a way that inshallah we will be able to achieve Jannah in return and we will be able to be the means of others also entering Jannah by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, after three days in the bush in Zimbabwe with cows and sheep, mashallah, it's very refreshing to be here in cold Birmingham. For me it's quite cold. So speaking about time, we find there is a lot that can be said. Everyone says, 11, 11, 11. It will never come back in 100 years. I want to rectify that statement. The second that we are living in now will never ever come back. Forget about 100 years and 1,000 years. The moment I stood up here is gone. It's over. It's never to return. What happened in that moment is over. It's written, it's recorded, and that's it. It's either going to be for me or against me on the day of Qiyamah. So I need to make use of it properly. I was so impressed, mashallah, listening to the talks, especially Brother Hamouda, mashallah. To be honest with you, nothing we, we see and we strive for is from outside the earth. Have you ever thought of it? What's the best thing you love? What's it? Gold? Gold is from the ground. Your watch? The leather is from the cow I slaughtered a few days ago. Yes. What else? Your clothing? Well, the cotton is from the, 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 the farms of Zimbabwe, mashallah. What else? Your watch? Your watch is made up of leather, it's made up of metal, which is also mined. It's made up every single thing you have. Your shoes, your phones, your motor vehicles. What's a motor vehicle? The metal is mined, the paint is taken from pigmentation from various sources. What happens? The leather seats are from different animals. Hope it's not pig, inshallah. And what else? You have the, the odometers, the, the, the rubber on the tires, everything is from the earth. We have not yet smelt what comes from outside the earth. That is why we speak of 
the finger being put in the ocean. It's not yet imaginable to any one of us. So a fool is the one who thinks this is it and this is the dunya and that's it. Because you haven't yet even got the brain to understand what is coming. This is why the sisters who say, wow, am I going to be with the same husband in the akhirah? That question is because you are using a human brain. When you have a complete brain, you'll want the same man ten times over. MashaAllah. Allahu Akbar. Why? Because now you know what it's all about. But we get frustrated because we don't have the mind to understand. And this is why we say time is so important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken a qasam. You know, we are not allowed to take a qasam. Qasam meaning an oath. With anything besides Allah. لا تحلف بآبائكم من كان حالفا فليحلف بالله You are not allowed to take an oath by your father and your daughter. You know, some people have a habit. I have a qasam on my daughter's head. Allahu Akbar. What's that? That is paganism. I've heard it so many times. Qasam on my mother. Qasam on this. Qasam on my this and that. No. The hadith says whoever is going to swear an oath, it should only be with Allah. His name, his qualities. Subhanallah. But with Allah himself, he's allowed to take qasams and he's allowed to swear an oath with anything he considers important from amongst his creation. So he swears by what? By time. Wallah And by the token of time, he's swearing an oath. We're going to come to that inshallah. And he says, I started this recitation for this reason. He swears by the night. The night is time. The night that is gone will never ever come back. It's over, it's gone. Tonight will not come back. If you hear, you hear. If you're not here, I hope you're doing something better, inshallah. This is for those who are going to hear this later on, inshallah. <laughs> and then you have, وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى Swearing by the day. Subhanallah. And Allah says, وَالْعَصْرِ As I said, in fact, so many verses of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes a qasam, he swears an oath by something to do with time because it is very, very, very important. And this is why the old Arabic saying, if you know it, الوقت كالسيفي إن لم تقطعه قطعك Beautiful Arabic saying, time is like a sword. Time is like a sword. If you don't use it to cut, it will cut you. Allahu Akbar. Time is like a sword. If you don't use it to cut, it will cut you. Illam taqta'ahu qata'ak. There are different translations depending on what the depth of the Arabic language you have. But that's the gist of the meaning. You need to use your time positively. And we have so many ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'd like to mention one of them. Narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari. Ni'matani maghboonun fihima kathirun minan nas. There are two gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that many people have not realized or are deceived regarding its importance and its magnitude and its greatness. What are the two things? Your health and your time. Your free time. Now here I know we're speaking of free time. That's because you're meant to be occupied in that which will benefit you, not in that which will not benefit you. Because you only live the moment once. And this is why Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he used to say, إِذَا أَمْسَيْتَ فَلَا تَنْتَظِرِ الصَّبَاحِ وَإِذَا أَصْبَحْتَ فَلَا تَنْتَظِرِ الْمَسَاءِ He used to say, when you enter the evening, don't wait for the morning to do something. If you have to, do it now. And when you enter the morning, don't wait for the evening. If you have to do something, do it now. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ also says, Salli salata muwadda'in. When you fulfill your salah, each time fulfill it as though it is your last salah. Your last salah. Like the robbers have told you with a gun on your head. This sounds more like Johannesburg, mashallah. With a gun on your head. And they tell you, right, your last wish. You say, I need to pray. That will be the longest prayer ever, believe me. <laughs> the longest, the most beautiful. And mashallah, if he was an honest robber to allow you the last wish, he'd probably get so irritated with your delay, he'd disappear. Alhamdulillah. So you still have another one. And then you, you, you would actually miss the sincerity of that salah, hoping that someone else could show a gun to you. 
Allahu Akbar. I see without the laughter, people didn't really think that that was, you know, they would like someone to actually have a gun each time. But Allah is closer to you than that man with his gun. And Allah is closer to you than you will ever imagine, than you are to yourself. Why then do we not take our time to read our salah? Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors and grant us all goodness. I always seize the opportunity whenever we're saying something, it's a sunnah, that when you're saying something and some goodness you know, is mentioned, you ask Allah to grant you from it. Immediately, don't waste time. And whenever you're saying something which has in it a little bit of uh, fearsome, uh, fearful items or fearful mention of something, you ask Allah to protect you from it. So that is why no one knows when the dua will be accepted. It's important for us to seize the opportunities. May Allah forgive us. And may Allah grant us Jannah and grant us goodness and make us from those who can use time correctly. You know, time is so, so, so important. We become people who are connected to what we see in the dunya. We make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that dua sometimes, the prayer, is connected to something we want now. Nay, behold, you tend to love that which is in front of you, the worldly items. You ask for them a lot, subhanallah. We, we love it, we do. Something, if I were to tell you, like, who wants a Ferrari? MashaAllah, I think, well, I'd want two, inshallah. I'd, I'd want one too, MashaAllah. And if we were to say, okay, who is prepared, MashaAllah, let me not say donate some money to the cause. But who is prepared to do something? If it's religious, you find a few less people. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change that for us. You know, it reminds me of a joke, mashallah, me and my parrots. For those of you who might have heard the parrot joke on the internet, I see some people have gone to town with it, but no problem. So long as you come back from town to the varsity, it's all right. They say there were four parrots, two belonging to a pastor and two belonging to a certain businessman. The two belonging to a businessman were males. The two belonging to the pastor were females. So what happened is the females were used to praying every day, quiet and you know, asking and so on, praying, praying. Every time you see them, they're praying. And the other two were vulgar, swearing, attitude, so on, everything behind money, money, money. I'm trying to show you about prayer and dua, dua. The people pray when they need the prayer. Well, you'll hear the end of the joke anyway. So what happened is the pastor visited the businessman and he saw the parrots. So what happened is, he says, look, I've got a solution. All the swearing and everything, these parrots need good company. I've got good company for them. I'll bring you mine. So what he did is, he brought the two females and put them into the cage with the males. And uh, the f a few days later, he visited them and he noticed that the females became similar to the males. Instead of them having a positive impact, they stopped praying. No more prayer. So he asked them, why did you stop praying? He says, well, our prayers were answered. Mashallah. <laughs> there you are. Our prayers. <laughs> our prayers were answered. So Allah keeps us in the condition of need because we need to continue praying. I wonder what they prayed for. But anyway, Allah makes it easy for us by keeping us in need so that we can raise our hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because sometimes what happens is the minute we, what we are asking for is achieved, we tend to forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a verse in the Quran. It's a verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of how man calls out to Allah as though he is, you know, so, so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the minute he's given what he wants, he forgets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to make sure that we are from those who call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. We have a problem and the problem is many of us do not value time. A hadith comes to mind where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, Ightanim khamsan qabla khams. Seize five opportunities before they are overtaken by five conditions. And those five conditions would mean that the opportunities you have are lost or you had had were lost. What are these opportunities? The first one, the opportunity of your health before sickness overtakes you. When you're healthy, that health is temporary. It will definitely, definitely be tested. It will either go away in batches or sometimes completely. So you need to use your health. When you're healthy, make sure you do something constructive. Make sure you use that health in the right direction. Instead of 
waiting. And then when you're sick, you say, I wish I could have read Salah. Now I'm sitting, I can't even read Salah standing. No, we use it in the right direction. The next point, I'm no, no specific order, the hadith, the order of the hadith, I'm, I'm not extremely certain of it. But the, the next point being made mention of in the hadith, seize the opportunity of your young age before old age overtakes you. Shababaka qabla haramik. When you're young, you can do a lot. When you're old, you can do a little bit less. When you're at varsity, there is a lot you can achieve. Once you leave varsity, don't be from amongst those who think, wow, when I was there, I could have done this and could have done that. And I could have, you know, I should have stayed away from this and that and so on. And my company was terrible because company really makes you or breaks you. Believe me, your company nowadays makes you or breaks you. You've got to choose your friends and you've got to expel people from your circle. Very, very important. So make sure you use that very, very strictly. Then the next part of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, use your wealth before poverty overtakes you. So when you have a little bit of money, do something good with it. You can save it up and buy something important or you can donate a portion of it and make sure that you've done something that you will be proud of tomorrow. You will not look back and say, what happened? I should have done this. Ya laytani fa'altu wa fa'alt. I should have done this and I should have done that. The next part of the hadith, use your life before death overtakes you. Use your life before death overtakes you. That is obvious. That whilst we're alive, we make the most of it, inshallah. We try, you know, time, time is a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have we ever thought of that? Time is a creature of Allah. Our brains would need a lot of thinking to understand what I just said. Allah created time and he made in it three tenses. The first tense, the past, then the present and then the future. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for him, the, the future is as good as done because time is nothing. It is reported in a narration that time will be brought in the presence of everyone on the day of Qiyamah or when the people of Jannah are in Jannah and the people of Jahannam are in Jahannam. Time will be brought forward in the, in the form of a little animal and slaughtered in front of everyone. And Allah will say, O people of Jannah, Naimun Naimun, forever and ever you will be in Jannah. Time is gone, it's over. If I were to meet you in Jannah, inshallah. A billion years after we entered there, and you would say, hey, you know what? Didn't I meet you in Aston? I say, yeah, we did. We did yeah. <laughs> I remember that, yeah. Well, you know what? You've been in Jannah. How many years have passed? You're still looking young, brother. MashaAllah. A billion years have passed. A billion years? How many to go? What's the answer? Infinity. We only just started. Allahu Akbar. We've only just started. That's time. Time is gone. And this is why, if you look at Surah Al-Kahf, Allah speaks about His knowledge. The knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows the past. He knows yakunu. Yakunu is mudari'. Mudari' can be present or future tense. And He knows that, and I like to translate it this way because there is dalil of it. Allah knows that which was never going to happen. If it were to happen, how it would have happened. Have you ever thought about that? That which is not going to happen. If it were to happen, how it would have happened, Allah knows that. Let me give you a quick example of that. In Surah Al-Kahf, the, the narration of Al-Khidr and Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, where he killed a little boy. Why did he kill the boy? The boy was never meant to live. His predestiny had been ending there. Or should I say it was destined that his life was going to end there. But Allah says, had he, given, had he been given a life, he would have been a very bad boy, which means he was never ever going to live. But had he lived, this is how his graph would have actually moved. I hope you understand my language there. So this is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So getting back to this hadith of time, it's important for us to seize the opportunity of our life before death overtakes us. And in fact, one of the, the, the points, the fifth one, the Prophet ﷺ speaks about faragaka qabla shughulik. Use the opportunity of your free time before you become occupied. 
So many times we want to do things and we don't end up doing them. And then later on when we realize we needed to do them, what happens? There is no time to do them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who can take heed. Now, very quickly moving through, what is it that makes us waste our time? And I wrote it down so we don't dilly-dally. We don't waste time itself. What makes us waste time? Let me move through this list. And I think each one of us will find it relevant, inshallah. It starts with me. When we do not have proper objectives and goals in life, we waste a lot of time. We don't know what exactly we want. We don't know where exactly we want to reach. And we don't work towards it. Some people know, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do that. And they don't work towards it. If you don't work towards it, you're wasting time. You're wasting all your time. Because before you know it, you would have, time would be finished and you would not have achieved what you wanted. So it's important for us to have proper objectives. And secondly, a point I touched on, your company, your companions, they are also a big obstacle. If you mix with like-minded people who have similar goals and objectives, you will get there with greater ease. than if you mix with those who are heading in another direction. I was in Medina al Munawwara for many years. And let me tell you, there is a specific person I mixed with that I regret. Not to say he was a bad man, but he was not, he was a person who was not as serious as I would have liked to be. And as a result, I feel today I could have achieved much more than I did had I had company who was like, oh, that was like-minded. I hope you understand what I'm saying. And I think it's normal for a lot of people who've left, especially an Islamic university or tertiary institution, to think that I could have done much better in those days. I could have worked harder. I could have gone maybe to the haram and sat in more durus, more lessons and so on. It's important for us to make use of this opportunity now. You have your eye socks, you have your various committees, you have your clubs and so on. Make sure that you use your time constructively. Leave a mark, leave an imprint so that it can be a sadaqa jariya for you. So that it can be some reward, a charity that continues even after your death. May Allah grant us a good death. We need it. Seize every opportunity. When I was told 11, 11, 11, you know, so many things came through my mind. I said, no problem. Inshallah, I will be there. Because of that, I had to change things to be here today. Mashallah. I made a promise and inshallah, I fulfilled it. However, 11, 11, 11, strictly speaking, has nothing to do with the Muslims and Islam. No, it doesn't. We follow a lunar calendar. But we seize any opportunity to speak to people. Any opportunity to make an impact, any opportunity to create a little bit of a change, even if it means one centimeter, inshallah. For, for me, every second is an 11, 11, 11. I told you, it's never going to come back. So, the next point is the free time. I won't talk much about that because I've spoken already about free time and how important it is to use that. Also, being involved in that which is glamorous, that which shines, that which glitters, and chasing it. We heard about the dunya. Those who chase the dunya, let me inform you, it has no end. You keep running and you start sprinting at a certain time. Let me give you an example of the iPhone. You had iPhone 3, mashallah. Now the 3G came out. You had iPhone 3GS came out, mashallah. When a little while later, no, I heard there's a four. Wow, I need that. So you're now running behind the four. After the four, the four, something else came out. Then the five and the six. When I was in Cape Town, I asked the brothers, I asked the children at one of the schools, how many of you have an iPhone six? And three guys put up their hand. And I said, there isn't an iPhone six. <laughs> it was just to prove that sometimes we already believe in our dreams. I have it, mashallah. You know? That's an excuse. Instead of saying you're lying, just say maybe you know, in, the, in our dreams. We're so passionate that some of us already have the PlayStation 7. MashaAllah. It hasn't even got there. So, when we run behind the latest, we feel so backdated when we don't have that. Yet, it was doing our job fine. That Nokia that I've got is probably a dinosaur, MashaAllah. But it does the job. What do you want from a phone? You don't need the latest all the time. Well, did you see the apps? Well, believe me, the apps... As we are speaking, there are thousands of apps that are being created per minute. Are you going to keep up with that? So this is a waste of time. 
You're running behind something that does not come with you into your grave. That's the difference between a Muslim and he who is not. We need to have the iPhone that will take us to Jannah. We need to worry about the latest that will take us to Jannah. You have a Quran that is out that reads for you. MashaAllah, there you are. You know, you have something else that is out that is the latest that will help you increase and improve yourself. You need to have time for yourself that will make you a better person. Your wife can say that guy is the best husband on earth. Then you are speaking business. You don't even need a cell phone, believe me, to achieve that status. And can I add one thing? If you don't have a cell phone, you probably will be one of the best husbands. Because a lot of men are married to their phones. <laughs> Polygamous relations. Allahu Akbar. Allah protect us. So it's important for us to know this, that there are a lot of things glamour. Let me give you another example. Some people are behind sunglasses. Some people are behind clothing. Some people are behind brand names. It doesn't stop. They think, you know, they think of making things to keep the old money rolling in. And we like fools keep running behind. You know, I pictured it once in my mind. I'd seen a load of rats running behind a cheese, a piece of cheese. And as they got the cheese, there was one smelling stronger in front. So they threw this one and they carried on and they threw the other one. But eat from this cheese and be full at least. I hope you understand what I'm saying. You've got your cheese, the first cheese you've got. And what happens? It goes to motor vehicles, it goes to cell phones. And after that, it goes to your spouse. Why? You've got a wife. Oh, she's 1990 model. I need, um, now, I need a better, a later model. Why? You developed your habit of wanting the latest. So when you see your wife, she no longer appeals to you. When you see your husband, he no longer appeals. Why? Just like your phone. It no longer appeals. I seen a dude down the road with a bed of jeans, halfway down his butt, mashallah. <laughs> May Allah protect us. Yes, that's a problem. You enter the masjid and you don't know where to make sujood. Believe me. Why? Because as you're going down, you know, you just got to close your eyes in salah. They say it's makru. Sometimes it's farad to close your eyes, especially in masjids like this. And that's what we're following. And that is time being wasted. That is time that's definitely taking us into the wrong direction. We need to wake up. And we need to know it's about time we dress properly and left a mark. We don't need to just follow everybody that's doing everything that is being advertised on the television and the internet and so on. No, you need to have a purpose. When you do not have a goal and a purpose and an objective, it is made for you and changed for you by the media. That's a fact. Think of what I've just said. When you do not have your own goals and objectives in life, which are based on Quran and Sunnah, and on who you are and your role that you are meant to play, your objective is made by other people, your friends, your peers, and the media in particular. Every time there is a, you know, a movie, they come up with a new type of dress code and a new hairstyle, and then you have all these hedgehogs in the classroom. It's a fact. There's only one thing they haven't managed to do. A hedgehog, or should I say a porcupine, can shoot some of those little arrows. Men still haven't developed that, but very soon it might come. You know, you just you nod your head and one hair flies. <laughs> Believe me, they will come up with that, and then everyone will want that. I wonder where the button will be, probably on the nose maybe. Allah safeguard us. You know, then we have another very important point, the hatred that we have in our hearts for, for one another. The jealousy, the envy, it's a waste of our time. Life comes once. We don't have room to hate each other. Some people don't talk to their brothers and cousins and uncles for years on end, they cannot solve a problem. Sometimes we need to say, I'm sorry, even though you know you're not wrong. And I've come across people who tell me, I make sabr, 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 sabr. How long should I make sabr for? Well, until you die, brother or sister. Jazakallah khair. What do you mean until I die? Sometimes it's worth your while to make sabr until you die. Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. Allah is with those. Allah's assistance and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is with those who bear patience. Be patient. Life is, you know, not, not everlasting. It will stop. But they are oppressing me. Well, sometimes, yes, you are allowed to stand up for justice. I'm not saying no. You are allowed. You should stand up for justice and so on. But sometimes you have to bear patience. Patience is better for you than to stand up for justice. Just bear patience. Forgive. Learn to overlook. Weigh the pros and cons and make a decision that's better for you. I want to give you one true example. 
I was once driving in Santon, which is quite, uh, you know, a, a posh area in, in Johannesburg, and uh, a lady drove into the, the back of my vehicle. I had a Toyota Corolla that time. And what happened is it was damaged quite badly. And uh, I had my family in the vehicle. Uh, the boot was full of stuff, and I had a lecture that I had to deliver about five hours later at, uh, in a town that was about three hours away. So I looked at her, I looked at the damage, and I said to myself, this will probably cost me, I think, about 400, 500 quid, you know, British currency. And I looked at this lady, and she says, I'm very, very sorry, and I'm, you know, so on and so forth. And I said, what's the procedure? And she recited it to me as though she makes an accident every day. <laughs> she says, well, I've got to do this. I've got to call the cops. You've got to wait. They'll take about so long to come, and they'll do this. And, and I said, wow, this woman is expert. She knows, experienced. I said, I forgive you, ma'am. Repair your cars. I re repair your vehicle. I repair mine. Thank you. She looked, what? You know, as it is when you look at someone like me, you know, like I walked in today, immigration, everybody's giving me dirty looks. <laughs> What's wrong, you know? <laughs> so she looks at me, she says, Ah, oh, thank you very much. Can I have your phone number? <laughs> For the right reasons. She said, Look, because I work and my bosses will want to know how the car was damaged. Anyway, I ended up giving her the number and so on. And uh, the same evening, I called the brothers in the city I was going to and I said, Look, I've got a problem. My vehicle is moving, but it's damaged. I will need to repair it. So one of the brothers had a huge panel beating place. And before, look, I was trying to gain time solely for one reason. I didn't mind paying, but I didn't want a thousand people to be waiting for me and me not pitch up. So I said, rather take this. And look what plan Allah had in place. There was a gentleman, a brother, who had a place for panel beating. I arrived at the time of Asr. He kept his whole team back. They repaired my vehicle and painted it just after Salatul Isha. They redid the whole vehicle and added so many new things in it. The following day after Salatul Fajr, I was meant to leave. He gave my vehicle back, smelling of new paint with so many different extras. Jazakallah khair, brother. How much will that be? He says, complimentary. Allahu Akbar. Now, why I'm saying this is because that is time management and the gift of it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know it's my own example, but the reason I'm sharing it with you is to see that sometimes, you know, I could have, I was not in the wrong, I could have got my right, but it will take me four or five hours, I've lost this lecture, I've got so much stress and tension. This is why when we are doing things that are unnecessary, we have a lot of stress, tension in the mind. So remove those things that are unnecessary. We give the example of the pot. Each one of us, we have a capacity like a huge pot. And in our lives, there are things that are equivalent to sand, things equivalent to stones, things equivalent to rocks. The most important things, the rocks, the big ones. If you put the rocks in first, you will be able to get the stones into the spaces of those that the rocks have created when they're in. And then you can put the sand and it will all fit in because you prioritized. But start with the sand, then what happens? You've got no place. No pla when you put the stones in, the rocks are all out. The most important things are out. And this is why a lot of people who complain about lack of concentration in Salah, I tell them, you have unnecessary things in your brain. Take them out. Can I tell you what's one of the biggest, and this I'm being open, we're speaking to young people, and this is a message to carry elsewhere. I'd like to hope we're not guilty of what I'm about to say because it's a big one. But we, we are to carry it to others. One of the biggest reasons why people do not even want to read Salah is pornography. May Allah protect us, our offspring, our colleagues, our children, People don't realize it has such a big impact, such a huge impact on, on the mind, on the emotions, on the spirituality, on everything we do, on our thinking, on the way we look at the opposite sex. Everything changes and it changes quite badly. And the worst thing is we stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we've lost concentration. Then we say, Sheikh, give me a dua. I need to concentrate. My brother, my sister, a single dua without doing something about it will not solve your problem. You need to do something about it and then make a dua together with it. A lot of people say, I need a good proposal. Give me a dua. So now you give them, Rabbana hablana min azwajina. MashaAllah, good dua. But do something about it. Have you gone out? Have you spoken to some brothers? Have you, you know, you need to do something active about it within the limits of the sharia.
The same applies to passing your exams. You know, make dua that I pass. Well, you sleep all day. What do you expect? You know, you think it's just a dua. If that was the case, we would have all had those duas. So it's important for us to know this. And it's important for us really to make a difference in our lives. When we have unimportant things in our minds, then those which are more important leave our minds. Then we have another very, very important point. Some people have a habit of starting something. Before they've finished it, they start something else. And starting a third thing before they finish the second. When you do something, do it properly, complete it, and then go for something else. This means when you do something, do a thorough job. Some people, and I do know, they start a course. Two years down the line, no, I don't want to do this course. Go to another one. They do another course, and two years down the line, I don't want to do. Well, look, if it happened to you once, probably, maybe it was the wrong field. Maybe you've now chosen the right one. But finish something. Finish it. And your best bet is choose properly from the beginning. I've given you an example which I thought might be closer to you. But that example fits for anything in your life. Also, what is extremely important is when we do not tolerate others. We spoke about tolerance moments ago. You know, we are all different. Every one of us is different. Amazingly, if you shave my head, and I shave yours, and we shave everybody's heads, and we had to take a super print of the way our hair grows, every one of us would have a hair print different to the other, from the beginning of the creation to the end. So not only are our eyes different and the thumbprint different, but our ears are different, the mouth, the, the teeth, every single thing. No two zebras are the same. Ask me, I come from Africa. <laughs> Amazing. Nothing is the same. Your toes, your nails, nothing is the same. But we still get along with each other. We're supposed to. So sometimes we will have differences bigger than that. You know, you have a Muslim and a non-Muslim. That's a big difference. We tolerate them. We're living in a country where they tolerate us. And if they don't, it doesn't mean we don't tolerate them. It is them who are displaying a quality that is a negative one. We tolerate them on condition that they tolerate us to the degree that we have our religious practice. And that's the norm on the globe today. But for people not to tolerate someone who has a different view within Islam, promote the view you have. Teach it, debate, you know, talk to others about it, try and let others... You know, people always ask me, are you Hanafi, you know? Are you Shafi'i? Are you Maliki? Well, what difference does it make to you, brother? What I've said here, is it correct? If it is, take it. If it's not, throw it right out and throw me with it, inshallah. I think it's about time we... You know, you, you can be who you are, but you need to know, really, Tolerate others. When you don't, it creates a hatred in your heart. You think you're the only one, you know, the only one who's right. Who knows you may be wrong. Allahu Akbar. You may be totally wrong. You may be heading in the wrong direction altogether. And I tell people this when it comes to meetings that we have sometimes and you hear one, one guy who thinks he's so smart giving a view that's totally unacceptable and you know sitting there that you have a view that will actually make him feel that his view is nothing. His view is nothing. And... Sometimes you just let them have it their way. I don't know if you know what I'm saying. You know, it happens even in the homes. Sometimes you have a spouse debating about what to cook. Come on, I have a rule in my home. I never ever decide what shall be cooked. No, don't just cook anything. You know, no food, don't worry, I will cook. Mashallah. <laughs> we need to be easy going people. We need to be easy going people. In that way, you'll be able to make use of your time. If not, you, your, your mind, your emotions, your mental capacity, your physical capacity, your health, everything goes. Why do people depress? In most cases, it's because they don't know how to deal with taqdeer, qadr. In most cases, people do not surrender to the decree of Allah. Islam is one of the only religions where part and parcel of what makes you a Muslim is to believe in qadr that it is from Allah. You know, predestiny is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And still you have people, why did this happen to me? Why? You know, why me? I've been through this divorce. Why did it happen to me? You know, and no, I'm going to fix her up and I'm going to fix him up and he won't see the children ever again in his life. That type of behavior is just destroying our time in this dunya. You won't achieve anything. 
Probably that child will be resurrected with the father on the day of Qiyamah. Then what are you going to do? Ya Allah, I fought a court case for this man. Why did this happen? Allahu Akbar. It doesn't help. Wallahi, it doesn't help. So let's learn these lessons. I know my time is probably up. Because I normally, when I'm just warming up, time's always up. But that's what it's all about. Time is never enough. Never ever. Let's use it, inshallah, in the right direction. Let us make sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning let us make sure that we call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. Once we have used our time properly and we learn to be systematic in, in our life, we will feel so good. We will be able to achieve our goals. You know, we will be able to achieve something in life, be happy. We will be able to make sure that every moment we have had has been used in the right direction. And this is why don't wait to turn to Allah. You know, if we wait to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we wait to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we may never ever get that opportunity. So one thing we should never wait for is to turn to Allah. You know, the sisters, subhanAllah, even the brothers, sometimes there's a religious decision we need to make. Make it now. Don't say, okay, I'm not, you know, holy enough. I don't, I still want to enjoy my life. I still want to, you know, I, I cannot go for Hajj now. I still need to do this. No, it must happen now. N-O-W. If it doesn't come now, it may never ever come. There are so many examples of it. So if you want to get to a higher spiritual level, let it happen now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. There was one, one joke that I wanted to share with you on anger. And I thought it was very hilarious. So I said, you know, many times people do not relate scholars of Islam with jokes. But I think our generation, Sheikh, it's important. <laughs> you see, there was a man. And this is showing you the irritation of lies and falsehood. The irritation of lies and falsehood. There was a man sitting on a train. Now, the train was a double-decker train, a sleeper train. So he's at the top. And three ladies walked in. Old ladies, they walked in and they sat. So he's at the top and they're down there. And he's hearing the discussion, sitting, he's, he, they're asking each other questions. And suddenly one says, how old are you? Now she looked 65. She says, I'm 30. <laughs> and this man was so irritated, so irritated, so irritated. So she, now the other two knew that this was sarcasm. You know, she was being silly. So they were also very old, probably a little bit younger than her. So she, so she says, and how old are you? Now, instead of saying I'm 55, she says, well, I'm 25. So she says, oh, and this man is now even more irritated. And so they asked the youngest one, and what about you? She says, I'm 15. <laughs> that was it. The man drops down. When he dropped down, they said, hey, what's happening? He says, I'm just born. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. <laughs> <laughs> We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. Really, I thought it was hilarious, something to take back, inshallah. <laughs> and uh, I hope and I pray that we've all, you know, learned something from this evening. I definitely have. I've got a very, very heavy schedule in the next few days. In fact, I've been, had such a heavy schedule from about a month. And inshallah, you know, we had the Eid and we had uh, back in Africa, subhanallah, we normally go out to the field and we... I normally go out into the bush and we spend the days with the poorest of the poor, alhamdulillah. Very, very rewarding. And you know, you come out sunburnt, weather beaten, but it's worth it, mashallah. And uh, I ask Allah to accept from us all the acts of worship we've engaged in. Please, my beloved brothers and sisters, remember something. Not only will this day never come back in our lifetime, but this moment and every moment does not return. Never, ever. So make use of it. And inshallah, use it in such a way that it, it will not come back and, and demonize you sometime later. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammadin. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala.